Hello. Hello. There we go. Thanks, everyone. I hope, uh, I hope we have enough space in this room. Um, there's, you know, it's not a very big room. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, I'm, I'm Todd Bart. Uh, I'm a uh, Dynatrace. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Dynatrace um, and a maintainer of the Open Feature Project. Um, I'm hoping today that I can kind of, uh, you know, show everybody how, as the slide says, uh, we can reduce risk, uh, conquer compliance, and perfect previews um, with feature flags and Open Feature uh, particularly. Um, I guess first to start, I want you to picture this, okay? Maybe you've been in this situation before. Uh, everything is green in our test environment. Our E2E -E test suite is, is working great. Um, the PMs are happy. We've delivered a new feature on time. Everything is, is basically perfect. Everything's going well. Um, and we're, we're ready to go. We've, we've actually you know, completed our tasks ahead of time. Then, suddenly, compliance issue, right? So um, maybe uh, all it comes down to is a particular jurisdiction uh, just introduced a new compliance law. And legal, you know, they run down the hallway at you and they say, we can't release this new feature. We think we're, we're implicated in these new compliance laws just in this one jurisdiction, but we got to hit pause. We can't release. The problem is there's already been contracts signed. Um, you know, customers have been asking for this feature for years. So where does that put us? Well, feature flags to the rescue. Um, like I said before, I'm a maintainer on the Open Feature Project. Uh, it's a CNCF incubating project since just a few months ago now. Uh, and really what we're doing is developing a standard for feature flagging. Um, so yeah, we provide a vendor agnostic, uh, community-driven, consensus-built API uh, for feature flagging um, that works with your favorite feature flag management tool or even your in-house solution. Um, there's a lot of companies that develop their own in-house solutions for feature flagging. I think before we can go further, though, we got to just level set. Uh, we got to define feature flags for everybody because um, I find there's lots of different levels of organizational experience when it comes to feature flags. Um, so this is a quote from, from Pete, uh, who's on our GC, our governance uh, board. Um, and he says, uh, he has this great uh, blog on, um, on Martin Fowler's website, uh, feature, uh, where he, he defines feature toggles, feature flags. So he says, feature toggles, uh, often referred to as feature flags, are a powerful technique allowing teams to modify system behavior without changing code. Uh, we also have the definition from our site here. Uh, feature flags are a software development technique that allows teams to enable, disable, or change the behavior of certain features or code paths in a product or service without modifying the source code. Um, this is my personal like, take on uh, feature flag maturity. Uh, it's kind of inspired by the Richardson maturity model um, for, for building REST APIs, if you're familiar with that. Um, and I'm going to outline these really quickly. I'm not going to go into too much detail. But I think like level zero, the first level, because um, we do zero indexing, obviously, uh, is basically what most people are familiar with um, just as a base level. So it's like an environment variable, maybe a settings.properties file or whatever. Um, if you're using Java, maybe it's a config map in Kubernetes, um, but it's static. It just may, maybe defines something that turns a feature on and off, and you have to redeploy your application to really take advantage of this. I'd say the next level of maturity after this is what we call dynamic configuration, and that's similar. Uh, the big difference here is that we don't need to redeploy. Uh, we can just maybe hit a REST endpoint on our application or use some kind of mounted uh, volume or something like that to actually change the behavior of our app without redeploying or restarting it. Um, the subsequent level, and probably where we're going to spend most of our time today, um, I like to call dynamic evaluation. So this is different in that uh, not only can you change the behavior at runtime, but it takes contextual data into account in evaluating the feature flag. So this could be HTTP request headers, um, user data, that kind of thing. Um, and then the last level, uh, as I conceive it, is what I call operational feature or operationalized feature flags. So this is where like, the whole organization is feeding data back into the feature flagging system. You have robust telemetry around feature flagging. You can see how feature flagging is impacting performance, how new variants are you know, impacting user experience and customer satisfaction. Um, like I said, I'm going to spend most of uh, our time today talking about um, dynamic evaluation, the kind of the third level there. And I'm going to dig into that a little bit deeper. Um, so yeah, characteristics of this, 
The return flag is determined dynamically. So you use targeting rules, uh, sometimes what we call them, or flag evaluation logic um, to do this. And the return value is based on you know, relevant contextual information. I just have a couple examples up here, app version, user geolocation, org or user entitlement, the current date and time. I'm sure you can come up with like tons of different uh, examples. Um, the, the nice thing about this is it means that flag evaluation logic can be centralized and it's independent of the application. Uh, so we don't need to actually code our flag evaluation logic, uh, like I called it, in, into our application at all. It doesn't need to be mixed with our domain logic. It can be extracted and, and hosted and defined and manipulated elsewhere. Um, and application authors don't have to have to worry about that. Um, and it's also centralized, so it's not in multiple applications. And I'm going to probably come back to this a few times during the presentation. I want you to think in terms of deferring and delegating the flag evaluation logic uh, to others, to later and to others, not the application author itself, or themselves. Um, practically, this means no more of this sort of code. Maybe you've written something like this before. If customer and legacy customers or if customer in this particular geo, you don't have to write that in, in your applications anymore, um, especially multiple times. Uh, it means reduce blast radius. So if you re uh, release a new feature, um, you can just test it on a small set of users initially. Um, it means that you have a robust platform for experimentation, and it doesn't require developer inter intervention. You've coded these flags in once, and then later, uh, marketing team, PM, um, maybe some kind of compliance officer, they can actually change the rules. Uh, again, we're deferring that type of thing. I um, mean, yeah, like I said, compliance agility is something else you get. You can disable, perhaps based on geo, um, in accordance with uh, with legal requirements. Um, this is our SDK. This is just one of our SDKs, actually. It's our our JavaScript SDK, and so this this is what it looks like to actually use application context to evaluate a feature flag. Here we have a very basic feature flag. It's called my flag. It's boolean. And um, you see some code here that looks like you might see it uh, as part of an Express request handler. If you're not familiar with Express, uh, this could be like a, a Java servlet um, or something like that. And all we're doing is taking the IP from the request and the email from the session, and we're embedding those in a context. And then we're using that uh, as a factor in the flag evaluation. Um, you might be thinking, this sounds a little tedious. I need to have this information everywhere my developers uh, want to use it. Um, we have some, I think, elegant solutions to that. Um, this is what we call a transaction uh, propagator. So what this does is allows you to kind of set this stuff once. Um, this is a, an express middleware. So again, if we were going to make a comparison to Java, this might be like a, a request interceptor or a filter. Um, and all you're doing here is setting the same information, but it's going to be available for the, uh, the entire duration of the, the rest of the continuation, basically the rest of the call stack. Um, if this was Java, you might be taking the same information and putting it in the thread local storage. The key to understand here is that the developer doesn't have to explicitly pass that context everywhere. You have access to this context now in the data layer, in the business logic, um, and it doesn't have to be explicitly passed because you may not want to alter your, your method signatures all the way down to your database just to get you know, an IP address or something like that um, um, into the feature flag. Okay, so we have this contextual data, but what do we do with it? Um, I mentioned before targeting. So targeting is the application of rules, user overrides, fractional evaluations, that kind of thing, and flag evaluation. Um, this is a, a screenshot from LaunchDarkly. It's a, um, a vendor of, uh, for feature flag solutions that um, actually works with Open Feature. And you can see they're doing something similar to what I kind of described. You're setting a, a user. You're saying the user is in one of these geos, and we're going to return a certain variant. Um, this is a, a, a similar UI from Flagsmith, another project. Um, that, uh, that supports open feature, um, and you're doing something simple or similar, right? So uh, Geo matches America, New York. Um, and the last one is this is uh, DevCycles CLI, and you see, again, something kind of comparable, right? So we're defining a new, we have a new targeting rule here, number two. Um, and if the email contains DevCycle, we're going to serve a particular variant. Uh, like I, I might have mentioned before, um, we actually have our own cloud native reference implementation as part of Open Feature as part of the project. And we call that flag D. Um, so it's written in Go. It's easily containerized. Uh, it, can, it can source flags from uh, multiple sources, multiple syncs is what we call them, uh, including files, HTTP endpoints, or probably most interesting, uh, interestingly for 
uh, KubeCon, uh, Kubernetes custom resources. Uh, and it targets flags based on um, basically a custom DSL we've implemented on top of JSON logic. So you can basically embed that right into a custom resource. Uh, here's an example of what that looks like. Um, we have a flag called enable mainframe access. Um, it's enabled. Uh, it has a couple variants. It's a very simple flag, so it's just on or off. And you have a targeting rule here. So similar to the examples we saw before, if the user's uh, domain ends at ingen.com, then they're going to see uh, this variant. And I'd like to take a quick second here to show you what that actually looks like, how that works. Um, this is our playground for flag D. So um, these are the sorts of rules that you would embed in a custom resource definition. Um, but I'm going to show you how this looks. Uh, I think we basically have the same example here. So you can see here's our rule. Here's our context. So it has a user email. And if I just hit evaluate, yes, it's true because it's targeting this user. I'm going to go ahead and just you know, throw some other junk in this email domain. And you see it evaluates to false. So you can embed all kinds of uh, logic in these. We'll see some more of that in a bit um, to target specific users uh, or services, whatever it might be. Back. I don't have my, my normal level of agility without my mouse here. Apologies. Thank you. Uh, OK, so. Um, Evaluation depth, is that it? Uh, I, I, I kind of spent some time talking about how we do uh, request context um, and, and context in general, and how we use, uh, use that in targeting rules. Um, it, you know, is that, is that all it comes down to? Um, well, in short, uh, no, as often is the case. Um, when you take into account uh, architectural, uh, infrastructural, UX, compliance concerns, all of those things get a little bit hairier. Um, so I'd like to take uh, a little bit more time just to dive into three hairballs uh, that you might encounter. Um, and these, uh, these, you might encounter them whether you're, not, you're selecting a, a vendor solution, uh, implementing your own kind of homegrown solution, uh, or, or using some of our, um, our cloud-native stuff. Uh, so hairball one, context contents. Uh, we want to give stakeholders maximum flexibility in building their flag rules. Uh, like I said, remember, we want to allow the, that to be deferred. So you think, well, if I just put as much information as possible in there, doesn't that give me maximum power to make decisions later? Yeah, but uh, I think we should consider a few things. Um, I, I can just throw all this stuff in the context, right? Every HTTP header, I can throw a session ID in there. The user's battery level, I'm sure you can, can think of a, a ton of stuff. Um, but we need to be worried about a few things. So one is PII. So some of this could be sensitive. Uh, it probably all identifies users in some way. Um, there's also serialization costs and network costs. Uh, some solutions are going to store a percentage of this data or, or, or some of this data, so we should consider the storage costs. It also introduces telemetry challenges, especially with uh, high cardinality values. So the TLDR is you don't just want to put everything in there. You want to be a little bit choosy. Um, hairball 2, uh, client side or feature side evaluation. Now, a caveat up front, um, when I'm talking about client versus server side, I'm talking about applications that actually run on end user machines. So maybe it's a mobile app, maybe it's a web page. Um, when it comes down to those, we kind of have a choice uh, in terms of where we evaluate our feature flags. So some implementations evaluate uh, everything on the server, while others evaluate them on the client. Um, and that has a huge impact on all kinds of performance characteristics, security, availability of the system. Um, so it's critical to kind of make the right decision here. And I have a little table here. Um, there's kind of pros and cons to, to both choices. Um, so targeting rules, obviously, they decide what feature flag is shown. If you're doing it on the client, you have to send them to the client. And that's a problem because they may contain domains. They may contain user names, even. Uh, so you have to consider that. If, if they stay on the server, you don't have to worry about that at all. On the other hand, PII is basically the other, the other side of the coin. 
Um, if you're evaluating on the server, you have to send personal information to the, to the server to do that. Um, if you do it on the client, it doesn't ever have to leave the client. Uh, latency is also really low on the client because everything is evaluated locally. There's no network hop. Um, while on the server, obviously, you have to make a network request. This can be mitigated with caching and kind of bulk evaluation. And I'll mention that our most recent uh, SDK, our web SDK, takes, it took a lot of time. We took a lot of time in the spec and in the implementation to really make sure that we had robust semantics to facilitate, uh, facilitate caching and cache and validation around this. This is like one of the biggest challenges, I would say, um, in a client-side uh, evaluation. Um, or server-side evaluation, pardon me. Uh, implementation difficulty. Uh, if you're, you know, you want to support multiple clients in multiple languages, you have to implement that same engine usually multiple times. At the very least, you have to, you know, create a WASM module or however you're going to do it to, do, to only do it once and then ship that in multiple uh, languages, whereas obviously if you do it on the server, you really only have to implement it once. Uh, the last hairball I'd like to mention is uh, sticky pseudo-random evaluation. So um, one of the key use cases for feature flagging is to do experimentation. Uh, and generally, a lot of times that involves uh, assigning a, a pseudo-random value. Um, and, uh, you know, I want to imagine a hypothetical really quickly here. So we have, say, two UI versions we want to test. Um, would we really want the user to have a different experience page load to page load? I'd say generally not, right? That's a lot of thrash. So usually we want our assignments uh, of, of flags to be sticky for a particular user. Um, and really what that involves is to do some kind of pseudo-random assignment based on a static identifier of some kind, and then use that as the, uh, as the basis for a, a deterministic bucketing algorithm, so to determine which, which variant the user sees. Um, here's some pro tips for pseudo-random assignment. Um, your bucketing value is probably not going to be the same for every flag. You may want to bucket some flags based on an org ID and others based on a user. Um, the bucketing algorithm uh, should be based on a fast hash. It doesn't need to be like cryptographic grade. Um, it just needs to be fast and, and random enough. Um, and, it, and it's nice if it's widely implemented, too. Um, it's also optimal if the algorithm exhibits low thrash when we add a new bucket. So you can see in the last slide, I had three buckets. Now I've added a fourth. It's ideal if the users aren't completely reassigned. Um, it's nice if we can add a new bucket and have you know, a few users from one, two, and three I'll move into four just to reduce the thrash, because you never know when you want to add another variant to your random assignment. Uh, demo time. So uh, what is the demo? Um, you can go ahead and uh, uh, load this QR code if you want to participate. Um, it's just a small app that's going to run on your phone. Uh, there will be a prize. There's going to be a giveaway at the end if you participate. Uh, so you can just load that QR code. You probably won't see anything except for a gray screen right now. Um, but what's happening here is we have a small app. It just has two feature flags. Um, and we're using flag D to basically read those flags and get them from a Kubernetes custom resource. Um, and I'm going to show you some basic targeting with this application. So everybody should. Does everybody see a gray screen? Cool. Yeah, it'll, it'll do that. It's a very basic app, very, very simple. Um, so basically what we have here is uh, we're just rendering, um, we have this request handler, and it just renders a very simple view uh, with a few variables here. Uh, this is our, our JavaScript SDK again. We just have two flags, hex color and emoji, and we're just rendering those based on the feature flag settings. So the other thing that's relevant is our Kubernetes resources. I'll start from the bottom because it's probably the least special here. Uh, we have a service. It's exposing, um, exposing this stuff on Google Cloud. Uh, we have a deployment. A couple things to note here. We have some open feature uh, annotations. These are what kind of allow a flag D to work. They configure flag D with our particular feature flags. Our feature flags themselves are defined up here in this custom resource. So we have uh, two flags, one hex color, like I said, one emoji. Um, and uh, you see there's actually a bunch of commented out targeting rules. I'll get to those in a second. But let's just do something really simple. I'll just switch this to Grim. So now we're going to turn the, return the Grim variant. And I'll apply this to my cluster. And now 
Yeah, we see a grin. So I didn't redeploy anything, obviously. Kubernetes is not that quick. Um, basically, what's happened is we updated the value and uh, the, the flag D um, provider that's plugged into our uh, open feature SDK saw the change. And the next time your page was refreshed, as you noted, uh, we got the, the grin. I'm going to set this back to uh, none, which was the default. So now let's do something a little bit more exciting. Um, I don't know how many of you here have Macs, but uh, if you have a larger monitor, you'll get an opportunity to kind of brag here. Um, so I'm going to just comment out this, and through the magic of YAML anchors, I can actually go and just change this targeting to a existing definition. So basically, look at this targeting rule here. What we have is um, basically we're saying we're going to multiply the window height by the window width and then see if that's greater than 4 million, aka 4 megapixels. Um, and then it's going to return indigo. Otherwise, um, it's going to return uh, blue um, if it's 24 megapixels. Sorry, if, yeah, it's, it's 24 megapixels um, or 2.4 megapixels, you're going to get green. Uh, what this amounts to is basically we're going to color shift your background color based on the resolution of your screen. Uh, and I'll save that and apply it. And so now if you're, yeah, most phones are probably going to be like yellow. Yeah, does, it, does anybody have like, a, anybody have purple or blue? Anybody have a really nice display? Oh, you have orange. Okay, most most people have orange because that's like not a super high pixel count. I see a netbook back there that's orange. Yeah. Um, so let's try something else. Uh, this is going to be a little bit of a callback to our uh, our example in the demo, or sorry, our example in my slides here. Um, there's probably a decent representation of people here from uh, different countries. So let's go ahead and change this targeting value. So this is going to change our emoji. And I'll go ahead and take a quick look at this. This is basically going to look at the language that's being sent with the browser. So we're grabbing this language variable, and we're seeing if it has the substring fr in it. And then we're returning fr, which is linked to the French flag uh, in our configuration. So I'll go ahead and save that and apply it. And uh, you should be seeing. Again, a gray background with some kind of flag on there. Does anybody have anybody have German? Germans, hold up your phone if you're in German. Okay, a few, few Germans. What about French? Anybody hear French? Yeah, a whole bunch of French people and English. Okay, there you go. So this is obviously targeting language, but you could see we could use this exact functionality to target based on on geolocation. Um, most phones here would be in France, so I didn't exactly target geo uh, for this demo because I don't think that would have been very uh, diverse, seeing as how we're probably all in the same room right now. Uh, and there's one, uh, one other one I'd like to demo here before we do our little giveaway. So this is going to randomly assign you a card deck icon, basically. Um, so hold up your phone if you have spades. Spades? OK, hold up your phone if you have clubs. OK, hearts. And uh, what, diamonds? Am I missing diamonds? Yeah, OK. So it's about, about uh, an even split. Um, and if we go to the targeting for this guy in our CRD, uh, you'll see it's basically 25, 25, 25, 25. So it's an even split between the four card hands. Now, lastly, I said there'd be a prize. So um, what I'm going to do is take a quick look at some metrics here. Bear with me. And I'm going to see how many people we have participating. According to this, 144. I don't really believe that, but maybe it's accurate. Um, so I'm going to do one more change here.
We'll have this giveaway targeting. And I think I want to give away a, a, about 10 t-shirts. So let's do, let's do 5.95. So if your phone turns uh, green, uh, you win a t-shirt. You can come to the open feature desk. Uh, who has green? OK, come see me after, OK? Uh, if you have green and uh, you get an open feature t-shirt. Um, but you can all come by the, uh, sorry, you, all, you, you can all come by the booth. You don't need the, uh, you don't need the green phone for that. Um, OK, so I have a couple more slides here. Uh, yeah, this is our, basically our contact slide. So uh, you have all our information here, um, social media stuff. I'd like to do a quick commercial for, um, for two upcoming things we have with Open Feature. We have the Contrib Fest. So the Contrib Fest, uh, basically, you can come and you can hack with us. Uh, Open Feature has a bunch of SDKs in different languages. We have a bunch of cloud nat native components. We have a bunch of providers you know, for, for uh, folks like DevCycle and, and stuff like that. Um, if you're interested in helping out, please come. We have so many open issues, so many languages. Um, we'd love for you to help out. And even if you just get started today, you grab an issue, uh, you can finish later. So it's a great way to get started in open source. Um, we also have a really cool session that's kind of going to go a little bit beyond mine into that next level of feature flagging, um, what I called operationalized feature flags. Uh, and that is really by combining open feature and OTEL. Um, so there's a presentation uh, later in the week on Friday by um, my colleagues, uh, Mike and Dan. And they're going to really talk about how you can kind of feed metrics back into your feature flag evaluations to really get a lot of really cool, robust information. Uh, yeah, I, I guess that's it. Um, we have a little bit of time for questions. Hello. Oh, my god, that's loud. Um, love it. Really cool. Uh, like the open specification and everything. Um, we like doing A-B testing and feature flagging and stuff on client side and on front end. That's great. Uh, but we're somewhat resistant to doing it on the back end server side, mainly because we work in a quite a regulated area where it's like essentially four eyes principle of like each change needs to have like two people look at it. Mm -hmm. um, and changing production behavior through a feature toggle is scary when you need to do four eyes. Yeah. Um, so of the platforms that are available, obviously you work for one. Um, are there systems for doing like permissions on toggles to ensure that like two people have toggled it before it actually gets enacted? Like, is there permission systems that essentially can, or or at least some sort of system to ensure that those sorts of compliance checks are done before it's actually feature flagged on? Uh, I mean, that's an excellent question. Okay. Um, I it sounds like something I, I believe that some of the vendors would, would probably have implemented. I can't speak to any particular vendor um, having, having that specific feature, but certainly like enterprise grade features like you know, single sign-on and, and I, would, I would guess something like that, like some kind of robust permission model. Those are the sorts of things I would expect from, from vendors. Um, yeah, I can't name one, but I would expect that there's some that have it. Good question though. I have another question. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, you talk about sticky sessions, basically. Uh -huh. How it would be implemented on the front end? Um, well, it, it's not a session in particular. Like you can use the session ID as what we call the targeting key. That's kind of the the identifier that by default is what's used to bucket people. Um, but really, it could be anything. So you could generate. Actually, what what I do in this app is generate a random number between one and a million and stuff it in local storage, and that that's. What's what is sent subsequently? Um, so you can really you could generate a UUID. Um, you could pipe the user session from from the uh, server and put it into the client, uh, for example, and use that. You really just need some kind of static identifier across whatever duration you want to make sure your bucketing is sticky. That's that's what's necessary. Yeah. So basically, we will uh, store an ID in browser cache. Browser, local yeah, storage. maybe local storage, yeah, local something storage. like that. That could be a solution, yeah. And if the user clears it, then you know they're going to lose that. But you could, if you really wanted to make sure, you could store it in the database as well. It, it's it's really a question of how sticky you need that to be, I guess. Hello, I have a question. Um, I wonder, is there any prescribed solution how to observe different uh, feature flags? Like, just to give you an example, like. 
I want to turn on some feature flag for 10% of people, it will impact some metrics, and I want to see results like how much it changes. And if it grows to 10 feature flags, like it's obviously become much harder. So is there any ready-to-use solution on that problem or any best yeah. practices? I, I would say, um, I mean, one that we've advocated for and that we have kind of first-class support for is open telemetry. So you could use open telemetry metrics, for example, to kind of get uh, your head around some of that data. Um, we actually have hooks where you can like arbitrarily add um, basically any kind of code during flag evaluation for each flag. And then you, in this case, it would be adding a metrics hook for OTEL, and that would increment a counter that's then flushed to your, to your metrics. Uh, probably small follow-up. Um, yeah, that's this will be just showing how many machines are using a mm -hmm. certain feature. What I want to understand is how to bind this data together with some metrics. Like, for example, I turn on some feature, my CPU goes up, and I want to see that for this machine, uh, this CPU metric had certain feature turn it on. So yeah. is it about just for every single metric that I'm interested in, we need to attach it as a dimension, like uh, certain features, or any better solution for that? Yeah, well, in that case, I would probably use open telemetry traces, which we also support. Um, so you can basically say, on this trace, we observe this feature flag value, and then you could, depending on what kind of backend you have for your uh, telemetry querying, you would be able to associate, okay, we have an increased failure rate, or a reduction in performance associated with this particular feature flag variant. Um, yeah, that's actually the sort of thing that Mike and, and Dan are probably going to talk about a little bit in their talk. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. Any other questions? Let's go for a cheeky second question. Yeah, no problem. Um, in terms of resiliency for, like, if things go... Feature flags are like evaluated and then like apps go down or the connection to the deferred place is broken. And so that's off. I'm assuming there's like safeguards and defaults. And uh, yeah, the, the biggest safeguard is the fact that we force you to pass in a default value at the evaluation time. So that's like our ultimate fallback. And most vendors do that as well. Like, like I said, we developed the specification in, in concert with a lot of vendors and we saw that was a very common pattern. So at the end of the day, mm -hmm. you have the default there in code. Um, and just realized I remembered another thing. Uh, you showed the, like a Kubernetes resource model version of the feature flagging, but I'm guessing it, that would be available through UIs and then through the UI, does that update the CRM? Or? Well, the, so the, the Kubernetes resources I showed, that's, um, that's part of our reference implementation for open feature. There's okay. no UI to drive it. It's, this is more of a solution targeted like towards people who are really interested in doing GitOps mm -hmm. um, and, and that kind of thing. So there's no UI um, in, in our case. Um, I mean, if you use Argo, you kind of have a UI because um, it's a custom resource there. But it's it's one of those solutions that we kind of recommend. Like you combine other solutions in the open source ecosystem to kind of you know, get where you want to be. Cool. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>